Hey guys, this is Venkat from ribbonfarm.com and welcome to my first attempt at a kind of state of the world video which I call a trace of the weirding and in previous years I've kind of done like annual retrospectives of kind of how I view things shaping up both in my own little corner of the world and the world at large. Uh, but this year I try, decided to try video for the first time and let's see how it goes. Let me see if I can share my screen here. Yeah. So uh, what do I mean by trace of the weirding? Well, I started out by thinking of it as kind of a state of the world, but there's two problems with that. One is it only kind of uh, sounds non-stupid if somebody like a you know the US president or the UN Secretary General is doing it. And second, it's the world has lately been getting so kind of weird that these sort of canonical party line perspectives from influential sort of perspectives in the world, they are becoming less and less useful in understanding and navigating the world. So I think of it more as a trace of the weirding, and by trace I mean you know just a path like uh, uh, just any average person might be weaving through the world through what they do, and uh, the weirding rather than the world, because really what motivates this is what's changing the world from normal to weird, what was normal and is now weird, what used to be weird and has now become normal, that kind of thing, and. Uh, there's another point about state of the world addresses being something like on an annual cadence and that gives you a sense that the world is evolving at this steady measured tempo, which is not really the case anymore, where um, so much can happen sometimes so quickly and at other times you have long periods of nothing happening. And there's a famous quote by Lenin, uh, there are decades when nothing happens and weeks when decades happen. So 2016, as I said on Twitter a couple of weeks back, uh, has been a year where it feels like several of the weeks have been kind of decades worth of change happening in within the space of uh, weeks. So it's a weird kind of world happening around us right now. You can't really judge the state of it in the sense of providing an accurate snapshot. But what you can do is kind of like narrate the perspective you have you know, as you kind of make your way through the world, through the year or through decades in weeks as the case may be. So again, this is Venkat from ribbonfarm.com. And what we're gonna try and do is get a sense of uh, the state of the weirding and the trace of the weirding as it appears from any one perspective, uh, mine in particular over here. And the way I'm gonna try and do that is with a map. But before I get into that, let me give you a little bit of background of how this uh, came to be. So a couple of weeks back, we did Refactor Camp 2016. So this is the this has been the fifth of this annual series of conferences, and the previous events were all offline uh, since 2012. And this is the first time we did it entirely online, and we had participants from all over the world, so it was a lot of fun. And we did the whole uh, conference on the theme of uh, well, the weird state of the world, and we had four sessions. Uh, the first one was the weird state of the state, as in the nation state. And uh, we used uh, a pers the perspective of Francis Fukuyama, who got famous for his book, The End of History, and uh, recently wrote a great two volume uh, book, uh, uh, The Origins of Political Order and uh, Political Order and Political Decay, which give you a really good uh, framework for understanding kind of how to think about the political state of the world right now. Uh, then we had a second session led by my friend Mick Costigan. This was on the weird state of capitalism and the economy. And again, we talked about a lot of ideas from a lot of different books. And uh, it's hard to make sense of um, the global macroeconomy right now. You have uh, 
uh, the whole world turning into what Japan used to be a decade ago. You have uh, a secular deflation uh, looming on the horizon. Weird things happening with bonds, uh, liquidity traps, uh, all sorts of fun things that uh, some people pretend to understand. I don't, but that doesn't mean you can uh, make no sense at all of the economy. There are interesting things to be said and discussed about the economy. And one book I want to uh, point out, uh, though we didn't talk much about it, is The Bourgeois Virtues by Deirdre McCloskey, which I'm reading right now. So as you can see, I have a lot of books behind me. These are kind of the books I'm uh, I'm pretending to read or browsing for uh, my Breaking Smart Season 2 research. Breaking Smart is another uh, website I run with essays on technology in the future. Uh, the third session, which was uh, run by my friends Megan and Rene, was about uh, the weird state of the crowd, as in the mob or true believers, mass movements, whatever you want to call them. And uh, this was built around two great books. One is Eric Hoffer's uh, The True Believer, which is uh, really relevant now. And the other is uh, Elias Canetti's uh, book, Crowds and Power. So those were the first three sessions. And the last session, The Weird State of the Planet, was about uh, climate change. And uh, I don't have a particular reference for that, but uh, anytime I think at like planet scale levels, as those of you who read my blog regularly probably know, my go-to reference for planet scale thinking is Douglas Adams' uh, Hitchhiker's Guide. So that's kind of the setup of uh, where I'm coming from and what this perspective is gonna be like, so that should give you a sense. And uh, let's switch to the map now. Okay, so this is my map of uh, the world around me. I made the first version of this map, which I drew myself back in 2012, and it was kind of a, an attempt to make sense primarily of the blogosphere around me. But then it kind of grew more ambitious and it became sort of my picture of the world at large. And as I sort of explore more themes in my writing or read more things or sort of um, work with others on their writing, since now there's multiple people blogging on Ribbon Farm, uh, this map kind of grew and got more fleshed out. And it doesn't just represent reading and writing. It also dis uh, represents a lot of discussions that I get into on uh, Twitter or uh, Facebook in a couple of groups uh, that spun out of Refactor Camp. Uh, so this is the map. A whole lot is going on. And uh, let's do some orientation at this sort of uh, big bird's eye view level before we dive down into the details. So those of you who read Ribbon Farm regularly are probably familiar with my obsession with two by two matrices. Uh, everybody hates them. Everybody thinks they're the mark of a shyster used car salesman consultant, which is kind of why I get a perverse uh, pleasure out of making them my tool of choice, but this whole map is laid out along a two by two. So, all right, let me undo that. Change the color here to a better color. So that's the Y axis and that's the X axis. And this little point here, which I've labeled point two by two, uh, point two by two is the origin. So this is actually not one of my uh, two by twos. This is Peter Thiel's famous optimism, pessimism, uh, determinate, indeterminate uh, two by two. Uh, so the right side is optimistic and the left side is pessimistic. The top half is uh, indeterminate, the bottom half is determinate. So that makes the top right quadrant indeterminate optimism, the bottom right determinate optimism, the bottom left is indeterminate pessimism, and then the uh, top left is uh, determinate uh, pessimism. So if that's kind of the lay of the land here, uh, I think I may have it oriented slightly differently than Thiel had it. Maybe the X and Y got changed around. But anyway, so that's the two by two. And what we'll try and do is uh, take a little course uh, and we'll start in out here in the ocean, work our way from the bottom right quadrant up here and like that through all four quadrants. 
And I want to point out a couple more high level features of this map before uh, we dive into some details. If you look at sort of a major, let me get rid of uh, sort of two by two axes here. Uh, if you look at the two major divisions of the map, there's two words here. There's commerce, yeah, and guardianum. So commerce and guardian syndromes of ethics, these are a pair of concepts of, uh, that uh, were made up by Jane Jacobs, uh, the urbanist, and they refer to two sort of big classes of ethical systems people seem to operate by. Uh, the, com uh, the commerce um, syndrome roughly refers to kind of the trader mentality, and then the guardian syndrome refers to roughly kind of the priestly defender of sacred values kind of personality. And this has kind of been a very influential dichotomy for me. And getting back to our two by two, it, if we, let me try and draw a little bit more here. So this is our two by two again. This top right quadrant of indeterminate optimism, this is what I think of as the trader quadrant. And all the other three are uh, the guardian quadrant. And the guardian quadrant is much more natural for human beings. Uh, okay, so that's as much as I want to say at the top level. Okay, maybe one more thing. And there are three gates here that we'll walk through. This is the Jane Jacobs gate. This is the gateway of pricelessness. And up there, this, uh, as you can see, there's a Hamilton Jefferson gate. And I'll explain those when I walk through. Okay, so let's clear all these annotations again. And start by zooming in. And we'll start over here. Okay, so as I said, my goal here is uh, to try and give you a sense of uh, a trace of the weirding and our trace journey will start at the sea of future nausea. And this phrase future nausea is uh, from a blog post I wrote a few years ago that uh, was very popular, especially amongst the UX and usability crowd. It uh, refers to this idea that there is always in society a sense of what's what I call manufactured normalcy, which kind of is a way of designing the user experience of civilization so that it changes as little as possible across the ages. So that even though the world has moved from like uh, extremely primitive technological states to extremely advanced technological states, we've kind of preserved a lot of uh, the environment of the human condition through clever design. And that's manufactured normalcy. And what happens when the world starts to change too quickly or too weirdly for the normalcy to keep up is that you get a um, syndrome that I call future nausea. So that's kind of where we are all sort of increasingly landing year after year, especially in 2016, where even people who kind of aren't on, uh, you know, some sort of cultural edge uh, living, <coughs> non-mainstream lives, even they kind of are affected by the general weirding all around. <clears throat> so the sea of future nausea is kind of the home state for where kind of any journey to make sense of the world must begin. And it's a good place um, where you can kind of begin forming a reaction to the state of the world. And some of them are kind of uh, well understood ones. Uh, Humor. So humor is one of my go-to ways of dealing with weirdness. If you can make fun of it, there's a sense in which you're successfully grappling with it. Another is to sort of um, leave the weird stuff behind and try and forget it and go out to uh, the limitless frontier and always things like astronomy have a romantic attraction, which is why in the last year and this year with the, the New Horizons mission and the Juno mission, they kind of were very valuable, I don't know, islands of sanity in my mental landscape in the last couple of years. So these are kind of um, where you start. But the most common reaction to future nausea uh, 
Another word for that is anomi, by the way, the concept made up by Imal Durkheim 150 years ago, which is this sense of like either too much structure or too little structure and a sense of normlessness and not knowing what to do with your life. So what happens when that happens is people look for kind of a determinate way to understand the world. And this is where this quadrant of determinate optimism comes in. And well, so, let's see if I can move this up a little bit. Uh, this, let me get myself a pointer here. This dam that I've built here separating the sea of future NOS here from what I'm calling Lake Determinate, uh, I've called it the Dykes of Probability Theory because one of the interesting things about how we deal with indeterminacy is that in our sort of anxiety to make determinate sense of the world, we kind of really in invent and rely on extremely sophisticated mathematical models of the world based on probability theory. So probability theory to me is kind of almost a psychological reaction to the indeterminacy in the world around us. And that kind of creates a protected space in which you can hopefully think in determinate ways. And this is I built it around what I call Lake Determinate. On the edge of that, I put this area called the Favela Chic Beach. Favela Chic is a concept made up by Bruce Sterling, the science fiction writer, and it refers to this sense of, uh, I don't know, slumdog millionaire creativity. Well, not really a millionaire, but somebody who's kind of surviving in the shadow of doom by kind of being creative uh, in a small scale way. Uh, you know, lots of arbitrage, that kind of stuff. So lifestyle design belongs on the Favela Chic Beach. Um, things like B Corps, they also belong in the determinate optimist uh, quadrant. Uh, B Corp, for those of you who are not in the United States, it's a new kind of corporate vehicle that uh, can have a social mission in addition to, you know, maximizing shareholder value. So to be a way to create a sense of determinate direction and purpose in an indeterminate world. And there's a lot of other things, all of which I sort of lump into what I call the hedgehog mode of thinking. And here I refer to the hedgehog versus fox dichotomy that um, I say Berlin made up. More about that later. Uh, things like design an obsession with design or an obsession with user experience and usability, all these kind of belong in a hedgehoggy view of the world. Um, and hedgehog, by the way, is, uh, is an archetype of uh, wanting to have a single totalizing view of the world. That's what a hedgehog view of the world is. So this whole quadrant is slightly hedgehoggy. Okay, so I won't have time to talk about a lot of this quadrant, but let's move along to the top right here. Once you get through the Jane Jacobs gate and give up kind of your, you know, B Corp missionary sensibilities and sort of declare I'm just a profit seeking capitalist and that's a good thing. That's where Deirdre uh, McCloskey comes in. Um, one of her strong claims that I believe is that capitalism does not need to be mitigated in order to be good. And that's kind of the idea behind um, the trader's sense of um, ethics or the commerce syndrome. So that's this whole quadrant. And as you can see, I've kind of like used this fence between the guardian and commerce and indeterminate and determinate optimism to divide up uh, the startup world. And the reason I've done that is that in the startup world, there's this very interesting conversation between those who think that uh, startups work on uh, trivial, useless little apps and don't work on real problems. So I put those kind of quote unquote, you know, scary air quotes, scare quotes, uh, real problems people in the determinate optimist uh, quadrant. And the people who are kind of happy with whatever outcome the market delivers, you know, whatever apparently silly thing grows into the next billion dollar corporation, that's good. You kind of trust uh, the market to deliver fundamental good. That's kind of the other half of the startup world. And um, Andreessen Horowitz uh, is one firm that kind of uh, has that philosophy. Peter Thiel's investments kind of belong in this other quadrant and both are well represented in Silicon Valley. But I would say uh, 
Hmm. It, it's actually kind of hard to judge, uh, but I would say there's more investor activity on the indeterminate side. Uh, and of course, um, it's fun to think in terms of unicorns. And unicorns are companies that grow to a billion dollars in valuation very quickly. But anyway, okay, so that's kind of our beginning of uh, indeterminacy and optimism going together. And startups, anytime anybody talks about them, whether it's politicians, whether it's uh, people outside the United States uh, kind of looking to emulate Silicon Valley, there's a sense that startups and entrepreneurship and things emerging out of you know a notional Silicon Valley that extends around the world, these are what are not only going to save us from the weirdness, but kind of like help us get on top of the weirdness, um, harness it for sort of interesting things. So weirdness and startups go well together as a positive combination. Entrepreneurship is almost the only you know, sort of part of society that treats weirdness is a good thing. The other part would be art, but quite often artists are actually not that keen to explore weirdness as you would imagine. But anyway, so moving on from, you know, uh, you know B Corp startups and startups that uh, kind of want to do quote unquote real world problems to more sort of commerce minded uh, startups. And then you have in, in the core of our indeterminate optimism quadrant, well, you have this big area of skyscrapers that I call uh, algo monopolium. So by this, I'm referring to the term algorithmic monopoly, the kind of like competitive advantage that uh, people say that companies like Facebook, Google, and maybe Twitter, if it gets, it act, gets its act together, uh, Uber, these companies sort of have this kind of advantage and even though in many ways they do not behave like classic monopolies they kind of are the end game of the new economy try and create these huge platform corporations that have some sort of uh, monopoly like i don't want to use that word but let's stick with algorithmic monopoly uh, that kind of uh, capitalism and Right in the shadows of this kind of capitalism, you have this area that I've called Gigistan, as in the gig economy. So, well, people like me, people who've kind of uh, pitched their uh, tents in the shadows of these big corporations and are trying to make a living in the new economy, digital economy, any way they can. So if you're a really talented engineer, yeah, you can probably go work in one of those skyscrapers if you're like the rest of us and you're talents lie in other directions, well, you're probably going to be spending some quality time in the gig economy and you either accept that and figure out how to do it well, or you kind of complain about that and try and return to, I don't know, a hundred year old dispensation of uh, capitalism versus labor. We'll talk more about that. Okay, so this picture, it's a very worrying picture to a lot of people because to them it looks indistinguishable from the robber baron corporations of um, you know 1890s and it looks like you know standard oil and carnegie steel all over again taking over the economy capturing all the wealth and kind of uh, leaving everybody else in a precarious condition there are elements to that criticism that are definitely fair but it's sort of uh, glosses over what I think is an even more critical and important distinction, which is between old money, old capitalism in the old economy and the new economy. And the biggest difference between the two is, uh, well, regulation, the amount of regulation. And if you kind of follow the macroeconomic debates, you'll see sort of a lot of consensus that a huge amount of the and inequality and uh, well weird state of capitalism is primarily due to things happening on Wall Street and in the highly protected uh, crony capitalist economy. So uh, I'm going to sort of come back to the rest of this indeterminate optimism quadrant towards the end, but let's actually proceed through this uh, gate, the Hamilton Jefferson gate, and talk a little bit about the old economy. Here I want to. Uh, point out a few different highlights. First, um, 
I've put Promethean spaceport at one end in the indeterminate optimism quadrant. And from it, uh, so by that, I'm really thinking of SpaceX that's um, reinventing uh, space launches. And from there, you take the Musk Highway all the way through the Hamilton Jefferson Gate uh, to the Pastoral Junction. So Promethean to Pastoral. So that transition, which I talked about a lot in Breaking Smart, is kind of a uh, transition and sensibilities from a very generative win-win growth oriented approach to the universe to a kind of uh, zero sum harking back to some romanticized past or romanticized never has been kind of future um, view of the world. So that's pastoralism. And in doing so, you move from engaging an indeterminate world as it is to sort of seeking out a determinate world. Uh, So it's, it's anxieties over indeterminacy that lead you through this gate, even though we are still in an indeterminate uh, kind of position. All right, I'm getting confused on my own two by two, but we'll uh, figure it out. Okay, before I do that, uh, let me point out another two landmarks. Over here, we have Serendipity Island. And serendipity has been a topic that I've been thinking about a huge amount lately. It's kind of almost obsessive for me right now. So serendipity is kind of the core dynamic of uh, uh, indeterminate optimism. And on the other extreme, you have <laughs> Zemblanity. So I've called these mountains Zemblanity Mountains. So serendipity is when you're surprisingly lucky, more lucky than you expect to be. And zemblanity is when you are unsurprisingly unlucky, which means that you have the sense of doom that things are going to go to hell and what do you know, they do. Uh, so you have this sort of predictable sense of doom and things going badly. <coughs> okay, so, and in between the two, uh, I've labeled this, uh, where, where do I have that? There's a third concept called Bahram Dipiti. Yeah. So Bahram Dipiti is the idea that when there is serendipity in the environment, you can have like external forces, like a powerful ruling class, for example, sort of squashing it. That's Bahram Dipiti. I believe it's named after uh, some Persian emperor or something. So a transition from serendipity to you know, zemblanity happens through this Bahram Dipiti pass in this model. And the reason I've labeled that uh, pass Hamilton Jefferson gate is on the left, you kind of have the military industrial complex that Eisenhower warned about in the 1950s. And that's kind of the late metastasized state of uh, kind of an American economic model that was first conceived by Alexander Hamilton. Now, when he conceived it, it was a really positive Promethean thing and it kind of grew and it's what turned America into this powerful superpower that uh, produced a lot of good in the world. But it's late stage after World War II as it went into decline is kind of what uh, creates, uh, created what we call the establishment today, whether you call it the establishment, the deep state is another phrase. Um, all these kind of refer to this um, kind of declined state of uh, the Hamiltonian uh, base. And Jefferson, of course, back in the day was uh, sort of a pastoralist who was looking back at the agrarian economy and uh, wanted to like not industrialize. And oddly enough, um, even though I believe his views were kind of silly, a lot of, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of people kind of like thinking of um, the startup world and a completely decentralized P2P vision of uh, how the world should be in Jeffersonian terms, even though Jefferson himself was kind of like a Luddite. So that's a good name for the gate, for the transition from serendipity to uh, zemblanity and from Prometheanism to pastoralism. And of course, the Musk Highway must end on uh, uh, the pastoral junction with uh, Wall Street. And uh, there's another reason to kind of use um, the Musk Highway and a spaceport as at one end as kind of a symbol for this, which is that 
SpaceX is a company that you can think of as uh, having taken an industry that was very much in this sort of uh, military industrial complex and turned it into kind of a startup uh, sector. So he moved an entire sector from that left side over to the right side. That's kind of uh, what he managed to do. Uh, okay. So now we are in the, excuse me, indeterminate uh, pessimism, uh, wait, are we? yeah, we are in the indeterminate pessimism quadrant. And this is the quadrant where as things get weirder and weirder, you have an establishment that doubles down harder and harder and its slogan might be something like, um, you know, keep calm and carry on, like the British say. And this phrase that I mentioned before, manufactured normalcy. Hillary Clinton is kind of the ghost of uh, the manufactured normal present. The uh, a view of the world as it might all be in trouble and there might be things falling apart, but uh, let's put on a brave face and kind of like, you know, power through and um, fix it. And yes, there's problems with that perspective. Uh, but that's kind of uh, almost a recognition of reality. It's the reality that kind of dominates 99% of the world right now. And there's a few interesting things to look at here. One is when you have Zemblanity going on, you have these forces of indeterminate uh, pessimism kind of like attacking this bastion of certainty that you're trying and failing to create. And obviously, <laughs> you're going to fail often, and that's why we have things like massive bailouts. Uh, so I've labeled that bailout avenue. You've got, of course, the military-industrial complex, and of course, you've got the entire crony capitalist sector. And you'll notice that I've made those buildings much larger than the algo monopolio. So this is things like you know the entire coal industry, which has a vested interest in fighting climate change. Uh, we've got um, you know. Uh, well, a lot of energy companies, we've got all sorts of like uh, big banks, all those things. They're all part of the revolving door uh, circuit between Washington, D.C. and New York City. And that's kind of crony will. And the ideological support from uh, for this whole quadrant comes from, well, academia. Academia is part of this quadrant. And as uh, we've kind of all seen over the last few years, there's been an increasingly urgent conversation as like uh, the critical theory people like to call it. They like to call everything an urgent conversation, but this one might actually be an urgent conversation. So urgent conversation around, well, things like political correctness and uh, social justice uh, warriors and kind of their regulatory capture of uh, institutes of higher education where it's kind of like they're doing to the language of politics what uh, uh, extreme regulatory control has done to healthcare costs in the US where you have insanity like, you know, uh, a Band-Aid costing $800 and um, what's built to uh, Medicare. So you kind of have this weird sense of proportions where all sorts of minor things uh, blow up and other sort of truly important things get forgotten and it kind of seems like you're looking at the world through a strange prism. Now, I tend to think of myself as pretty strongly socially liberal, but um, I kind of have a hard time getting on board with, uh, well, the priorities of uh, a lot of this social justice uh, warrior movement. Uh, but there's other elements in this landscape. Well, there's uh, things like the NSA belong there. Uh, what Bruce Sterling calls gothic high tech, which is kind of like these big doomed uh, vampire filled uh, companies. Uh, I don't know what else to call them. He actually thought Apple under Steve Jobs was Gothic high tech, but I kind of disagree. It belongs in this other quadrant. But anyway, Gothic high tech stands in contrast to Favela Sheik. Both are kind of responses to this um, same sense of doom. This one is kind of like cheery optimism, but on a small limited scale. So you sort of limit your horizons. And this one is kind of like, well, do these strange things and create this dark, horrifying landscape where you survive by well, turning much uh, more and more gothic. So that's kind of um, uh, 
what this whole quadrant is about. So let's uh, come back down Bailout Avenue and down Wall Street. And we've got, uh, well, I've labeled this part where Wall Street ends and through this crossing, the Talib trail after Nassim Talib, because um, in a lot of ways he represents uh, the thinking that makes the transition. But this gate, of, um, he's kind of going through this uh, break here, but the actual gate is up here, which I've called Gamer Gate. And this is worth talking about a little bit more carefully. So you've got the social justice war cathedral, you've got what I call the manosphere carpet, and you've got this thing that I've called Gamer Gate, and this whole thing in between is the culture war swamps. And let's actually zoom up over here a little, and this is where Bernie belongs, where he's kind of the ghost of the digital future, and he has been the voice of the millennials, his uh, people supporting him have been uniformly young. So I call them the millennial, uh, millennial supporting Bernie, uh, members of the millennial Martian, where ideally they would like to, I don't know, make uh, gourmet coffee and live in Portland, but since not all of them can make it and they have crippling student debt, well, they kind of are desperate. They have a debt burden, nobody is their voice, and well, they've made themselves heard. We'll see what happens to them. But anyway, so this is contiguous, well, with this area of culture wars, and if there are problems with social justice warriors, there's even worse problems in the reaction to uh, social justice warriors. So if you go through Gamergate to this manosphere carpet, so Gamergate, for those of you who don't follow the internet culture wars, was this, well, thing that happened, uh, I guess last year or year before, where it, it was like an online conflict between uh, um, well, gamers from places like 4chan and, uh, female video game developer. So don't want to get into that whole thing. But the interesting thing about it was when it happened, those of us who spent a lot of time online and were following the conflict, uh, we thought of it as this sort of uh, subcultural sideshow on the internet that would never amount to much and didn't really matter. But as it happened, that was almost the opening act for 2016, the uh, election year. So the Manosphere Tarpit, I don't want to say more about it, but there is such a thing called the, well, men's rights movement. Uh, it's kind of an anti-feminism thing, and well, it's a whole ugly bunny trail if you want to go down there and look into it. There are sort of edges of it that have a couple of legitimate political concerns that I'll get to, but well, that's the Manosphere Tarpit. Uh, but let's move along left from these culture war areas to this, what I call the cemetery of boomer dreams. So if Bernie represents the ghost of digital future, Trump in a way represents the ghost of industrial past. And uh, I don't want to talk about Trump, the guy, um, uh, he, he kind of seems like uh, really just a mask and if people aren't paying attention to him, he shrivels and uh, vanishes, something like that. So he's, Initially, it was kind of interesting in a tactical, political tactical sense, what he was doing and how he was rising to power. People make comparisons with uh, Berlusconi and um, uh, similar political characters around the world. But fundamentally, Trump is not interesting. He's not interesting as a psychological study or as uh, sort of a political leader. But what he is interesting as is as a voice of, uh, well, the ghost of the industrial past. Uh, most of his uh, supporters are much older, older than the mean, and they kind of represent the part of the old economy that has kind of failed out of Cronyville. So there's parts of the old economy that are surviving thanks to lots of regulatory protections, and there's parts where that structure of protection has collapsed, and so you have this sort of for dying, decaying part of the landscape. So we are now in the determinant pessimistic landscape where if over here you have Zemblanity, where you have a sense of impending doom, well, here you're living the life of actual doom, where there is no hope, there is no future, and you've got this entire demographic that has been sort of forgotten by the world as it sort of has uh, you know, changed course and gone down a different path. So they're kind of like almost on an evolutionary dead end in terms of technology and society. And yeah, if you have even kind of like the basics of um, global macroeconomics and uh, how technology works, uh, sort of, uh, if you're familiar with that, it's 
kind of patently obvious that he doesn't know what he's talking about in terms of um, how to fix things. So all his promises are false promises, but um, it's, what is interesting is that he does in fact provide a voice to, well, people who have kind of lost the voice that they once had. And to some extent you can feel sympathetic. It's, it's tough being ignored entirely. So, the, so this is a group for whom uh, uh, the flag with, uh, there's, a, there's an American flag with the phrase, don't tread on me. I think it's called the Gideon flag or something like that. Um, so that's kind of their slogan, don't tread on me. And this is a sort of proud demographic that sort of values its fear, independence very fiercely and has a lot invested in a particular sense of honor from being valuable to society and defenders of society, things like that. And they're sort of state right now is not that somebody's treading on them, that no, but nobody's even coming anywhere near them. So they're kind of forgotten. So they're in this determinate pessimist uh, quadrant. And um, as somebody put it on Twitter, when you're used to privilege, equality feels like oppression. So this is a largely white demographic. And to a certain extent, what's happening is uh, their status has been leveled to a lot of, uh, to the same level as a lot of um, well, other forgotten uh, groups by the wayside, left behind by modernity around the world. But well, since this particular group was um, a dominant class in a dominant culture in the dominant country, they have had a particularly harsh fall from, well, their own sense of grace. So that's, Trump's world. And between the two, the Trump world and the Bernie world, well, we have this generation war chasm. And of course, we have the cemetery of boomer dreams where you have all these old leftists whining that um, new leftists kind of don't get the old um, goals. And you've kind of got, you know, give me my flying car, give me my Mars base kind of uh, thinking that comes from uh, this attachment to the past. But enough about the determinate uh, pessimist quadrant. Let's make our way back to where we started. But coming back here from the cemetery and Trump to what I'm calling the global bro science laboratory. So this, the reason I call it that is um, if you sort of start with uh, well, people like Nassim Taleb and sort of uh, skirt through the manosphere tarpit and you kind of look at the values driving how these people are trying to, you know, claw back a sense of purpose in their life. They're kind of doing this slightly precious thing, which I, which I like to think of as bro science, which is, well, they're trying, they're trying to sort of understand the world around them. They're trying to like may run experiments, small experiments. A lot of them are focused on, well, things like, um, you know, getting fit, getting ripped, uh, pickup artistry, that set of concerns. So that's um, sort of one landmark there that we can take off from as we get back to our home quadrant. Uh, but I also want to talk a little bit about this area that I've called, uh, well, I don't know what to call it, but uh, uh, there's a bunch of little points I want to point out here. There's the alt-right hills. So this is kind of a new right. And those of you who don't know the term, it refers to a whole bunch of like uh, philosophies that are roughly uh, that range from like a reinvented right to pure reactionary to various kinds of slightly racist uh, kinds of uh, right-wing ideologies. Uh, NRX is neo-reactionary. Uh, put down here Molbug's lair. Molbug is an influential, well, social commentator is, I guess, what I can call it. But this whole area, it sort of passes through the gateway of pricelessness because I think of the distinction between them and the trader quadrant as... Uh, what their sense of priceless values are. And on the very edge of uh, the alt-right world is, uh, well, my uh, fellow blogger on Ribbon Farm, uh, Sarah Perry. So I've put down here something I call Sister Sarah's Ritual Convent. Sister Sarah is her uh, handle on Twitter. And she represents kind of a very interesting emerging subculture of thought, which... Uh, it's kind of on the edge of alt-right. It's also related to, well, uh, the rationality movement, which we'll get back to. But um, they kind of think of themselves as uh, 
beyond rationality in a sense. And if you go back a couple of posts on Ribbon Farm, you'll find like a survey of uh, Sarah's recent articles that give you a good introduction of what post-rationality is all about. Uh, now, some people classify me as uh, post-rational. So if you look at the map on Slate Star Codex, you'll find Ribbon Farm plotted there. I don't really identify strongly with that, but I don't not identify with it either. But right next to it, this idea of the barbarian forest, uh, this is probably kind of what I identify with as my psychological archetype. But enough about this area of the map. <laughs> Let's go back to the bro science uh, lab. And we'll go along this immortality trail. So immortality, the reason I bring it up is a lot of people who kind of make this transition from you know, startup success to new money to sort of really using as much science and supplements and so forth to extend their life, uh, they kind of are nominally on a quest for immortality. And um, one slightly ridiculous end of it is pro-science, but there's a lot of really good science as well. And uh, of course, uh, I very much doubt we'll ever have immortality, but Certainly, life extension is something that's real and a lot of people are working on. And I've labeled this gate the uh, pickup artist gate. So all these kind of themes go together in my head, like you know, becoming ripped and super fit, becoming great at picking up women, living really long, uh, having a lot of money, having a sense of mission, all that kind of like is represented by the journey on this trail. Uh, and while we're on the topic of immortality, I should point out that uh, Sarah has this excellent book, Every Cradle is a Grave, on, uh, well, the idea of mortality and um, euthanasia and things like that. So Sarah is uh, kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum from people who believe in uh, things like immortality. And another thinker I want to point out is David Chapman. He's not on this uh, map, but he also is very interesting to read on these issues. Uh, his blog is called meaningless.com, I think. Anyway, so follow this trail. Uh, I've put down Ray Kurzweil here. He's kind of the, I don't know, thought leader of a lot of this uh, philosophy. I've put down West River here, and that refers to uh, Jeffrey West, the urbanist. Uh, well, I, won't, I don't want to say much more about that, just kind of uh, putting a pin in it as something that's on my radar. But okay. Let's uh, wrap up our tour with, uh, we won't go on immortality trail, but back here from the industrial, uh, dying industrial Trump world, there's something called a secret trail and it ends at the Wailing Tower of Teal. So that's my little joke at Peter Teal's expense. And it passes by the less wrong prairies and the efficient market temple. So both of these, to my mind, are a way of thinking about the world that's very strongly rooted in uh, uh, rationality, the idea that if you take away a lot of your uh, cognitive biases and sort of uh, consciously work to improve your behavior, you can become, well, less wrong, less irrational. So that's, in a way, the opposite uh, idea of post-rationality. So post-rationality, in a way, is a reaction against rationality as represented by the less wrong community and i'm friends with many of them and um, they're smart people and i have fun sort of teasing them and they tease me but um, that's kind of the uh, a polarity that's very important these days the spectrum from bayesian rationality where you try to be as smart as you can to post rationality where you kind of give up on the idea of like idealized rationality of any sort forget you know pure economic rationality or even bounded rationality or bias removed rationality you kind of get away get away from the conversation altogether so from thiel to trump and thiel uh, was a delegate for uh, Trump and spoke at the convention. So that's kind of, kind of why there's a connection. And as you can see, it sort of passes by the efficient market temple. And this is, uh, well, a little attempt at a bad joke at my part, where even though I put the heart of capitalism in the upper right quadrant of indeterminate optimism, the sort of the trader syndrome of ethics, the commerce ethics that is practiced in that quadrant is very different from what is represented by the efficient market hypothesis, which has kind of turned into a little bit of a cargo cult uh, religion in its own right, where it's not so much about criticisms of the efficient market hypothesis at a uh, you know, empirical or mathematical level, 
but it's this idea that the EMH has become a motif for a belief in a particular kind of heaven and hell, where the efficient market is a particular version of um, heaven. So that's kind of the connection there. Uh, and of course, that brings up some dissonances between the worldview that Thiel represents versus the worldview that uh, Trump represents, because the efficient market doesn't exactly fit well with a lot of um, certain philosophies. But anyway, uh, the idea of the efficient market as a central element in your thought is probably more a guardian thing than a trader thing. And, you know, it goes better with priceless values than the idea of market pricing. Uh, which is odd. It's kind of really odd that efficient market uh, thinking is more like a religion than like a market uh, idea. Okay. So that kind of finishes our tour. I don't want to talk too much about uh, the other elements on the main two by two. I do have other things here like uh, uh, over here, I've marked the Gervais Underground, which refers to a series of articles I wrote called the Gervais Principle, which is about you know um, corporate politics and how to survive in mainly the old economy, but also the new economy. This is the town of Tempo, refers to my book Tempo, which is about uh, time and rhythms. And I have Bitcoin and Amazon and uh, the long now clock for 10,000 years over here. So lots of fun things, yeah. But let's move over to, uh, let me zoom in a little better here. To what I think of as almost my home territory of exploration. So the things on my mind that I'm thinking about a lot, uh, which all belong in this ocean of um, indeterminacy. So let's start off here. This idea of uh, the refactoring amusement park. So the tagline of Ribbon Farm, the blog is experiments and refactored perceptions. And Last year, uh, Sarah wrote an article where she talked about this distinction between theme parks and amusement parks, where theme parks are, well, built around a strong narrative theme, kind of have a determinate uh, grand narrative for the world they uh, try to capture in theatrical form, whereas an amusement park is kind of like just plain fun. There's no larger purpose. There's no sense of direction. You're kind of just going in there to like have your stomach churned around. So I found this a very fun and interesting distinction to work with. Uh, and um, it helped me sort of situate my own writing very well on this map. So the, my kind of main kind of writing which defines my intellectual identity is refactoring and it's it's an amusement park let's be honest there's no higher purpose i don't do it uh, to create like an ideology or philosophy for the world it's just me having fun with ideas and along with my other bloggers some of whom are more or less refactory than me that's kind of what ribbon farm is about breaking smart which is um, the series of essays i wrote uh, last year uh, on how software is eating the world. There's another season coming up, which will be on um, the future of organizations. But that's much more of a theme park where I take a set of ideas, arrange them around uh, a much more curated narrative on how to look at the world, and that's Breaking Smart. So refactoring is Ribbon Farm, Breaking Smart is a kind of theme park, Tempo the book is kind of closer to a theme park. So that's kind of my writing, how it situates here. And as for how I personally view the world, uh, going back to the fox versus hedgehog um, dichotomy I mentioned at the beginning, if a hedgehog is about a single totalizing view of the world, but you want to fit, fit everything into one grand unified model of the world, a fox is the opposite, where you kind of have like a whole bunch of little particularist, uh, almost pointillist little narratives or little models of the world that help you make sense of it. So you're not looking for grand unification, you're kind of looking for uh, coverage and you don't care if it's incoherent. And as I've written, I've been writing Rune Farm since 2007 and hopefully my writing has improved, but certainly my sense of why I'm doing it and how I'm doing it has improved. I kind of know what I'm attempting with my writing on Ribbon Farm and even though it's hard to describe, some parts of it kind of have like uh, motifs that uh, lend themselves to sort of, you know, 
explication. Uh, one of them, um, which I've labeled here, so the whole, this whole thing is called Fox Archipelago, and the reason I made it an archipelago of islands, as opposed to this, you know, big lake determinate with like, you know, consolidated landmass, is that that's what foxy thinking feels like, where you kind of have like this bunch of islands in this large ocean of indeterminacy where you kind of are starting to make sense of the world in small patches at a time. Uh, so Island 42. That, of course, is a reference to the answer to the life, uh, to life, the universe, and everything in Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide. And if you've been following my writing, you know that it's sort of like pops up with boring regularity. Like every third article, I'll drop a Douglas Adams reference. Uh, another idea that's been very influential in my thinking lately is uh, crash only thinking. So if you go back in Ribbon Farm, there's um, an article about this, but crash only is an approach in computer programming where you design programs so that there's no way to elegantly stop or shut down the program. The only way this program can be stopped is if it crashes. And the only way you can restart the program is by recovering from a crash. So in a sense, uh, crash only thinking is about thinking about eternity both in the positive and negative future there are no starts and stops there are only crashes and recoveries and that that has been a very useful framing concept for me that kind of we are in this for uh, we are in this universe in kind of an indefinitely defined way with no clear starts and stops we kind of crash into the world at birth and we crash out with death that's kind of all the structure there is and boundaries there are and in other directions, in space, in concepts. Again, there are no clear boundaries. This is not where your life ends, your worldview or trace ends, and this is where it begins. There's no such clear demarcations. A couple of more interesting things I want to point out here. Uh, climate change island. The reason I put that in there is that it's, it's become a very interesting subject for me to think about because every time humanity has taken on any challenge that's kind of like an, that requires an order of magnitude greater social uh, cooperation and coordination, civilization has, for better or worse, leveled up into a different state. And climate change promises to be that kind of like you know global coordination challenge. So that's why it's been sort of high on my radar. I wrote an article about it in uh, the Atlantic last year, which you can look up. Uh, I'll probably link to all these in uh, post with this video. So th those are some of the things on my mind that are really shaping how I'm thinking. Uh, let me point out a couple more here. Uh, some things that aren't necessarily on my mind because I'm good at thinking about them, but because they've been influential on my thinking. Uh, Page Island. So this is uh, Larry Page at one point said we should have a space for unrestricted exploration and uh, invention of uh, you know, new kinds of uh, society, technology, new experimental ways of living. And I think of that as uh, kind of like refactor civilization at Larry Page level. Uh, I don't have Larry Page's resources, so I can't do that. But in my little blog, uh, I kind of try to do that. Uh, Fjords of Sisu. So Sisu is a concept I learned about from uh, uh, Emilia Lotti. She's Finnish and she is a student of the Finnish concept of Sisu, which is like grit or stoicism. And it's this idea that when you're dealing with a very weird indeterminate state of the world where all kinds of crazy nauseating things are happening, what matters is really not your skill or resources in meeting them and sort of your plans in how to respond, but how well you regulate your emotions as evoked by your situation. So if you gain control of your emotions and you're able to sort of handle uh, and sort of regulate and manage your emotions, that's sort of half the battle won and then you can kind of figure out how to actually respond to the situation. So that's been sort of an interesting landmark thought for me and uh, there's you know, upsides and downsides, sometimes it's used hypocritically as, uh, well, as a way for people living in Algo Monopolia to tell people living in Gigistan that, hey, it's not precarious living, it's not that you have variable income, you just have to be more of a stoic. So yes, it's used in certain hypocritical discourses that way, but I think the fundamental and philosophical idea is really good, where we have spent like a century in at least the developed part of the world, developing this kind of like uh, 
false illusion that the world is a very determinate, safe, controlled place where you can kind of like uh, script your own life and have it play out exactly the way you want. And that fiction is collapsing, even though people living in, well, the ghost in the manufactured normal present kind of still hope it's not uh, false. But Sisu and other similar concepts, they refer to, well, let's get rid of the delusion and try and live in the world as it is. So that, those are some of the ideas and I put in uh, Mark Andreessen here, that's his Twitter tagline and I put in a little storm there because well, he invented tweet storming and that's uh, what I use for my breaking smart newsletter and he's been a very influential person in shaping my thinking in the last couple of years, especially as I wrote breaking smart. So uh, that's kind of my little neck of the woods. Let's, uh, Finish up with what I think is sort of the broadest philosophical foundation for a lot of my thinking. And I think a lot of the thinking of people who enjoy Ribbon Farm and uh, my writing, as well as, uh, you know, Refactor Camp and the little community that seems to have been growing around it, despite my reluctance to, you know, do community stuff. Okay, Carson Mist. So you've got the ship here, which I call SS Ribbon Farm, it's loaded with uh, containers. Uh, some of you make fun of me for using containers as my motif for, uh, I don't know, just my general nerdery about how I think about the world. But anyway, that's me sailing into the Carsian mist in uh, a container ship. Uh, hopefully, sort of poking at forces of serendipity rather than uh, just living out a script. But Carson Mist, the name comes from uh, probably the single most influential book for me in the last couple of years, which is Finite and Infinite Games by James Cars. And the whole book uh, is sort of built around this distinction between finite games, which are games that you play to win, and infinite games, which are games that you continue to continue playing, uh, or play to continue playing. And this has been sort of a I don't know, profound distinction for me and it kind of helped me make sense of why I do all the things I do and why I do them the way I do them and why I kind of belong uh, in this indeterminate optimist uh, beyond that quadrant in this ocean of indeterminacy where uh, I don't really think of myself as either an optimist or pessimist but if you think of yourself as somebody who plays to continue playing, you're kind of like life positive in a very fundamental way. Whereas if you are playing to win, you're, you're in a way life negative. And, and that perhaps kind of um, is a good philosophical note on which to, well, end this video, trace of the weirding episode. So that's it. And let me stop sharing here. So let me know. What you think of this video and if you'd like to see more videos um, this is kind of just an experiment for me uh, i have been doing a lot of um, podcasts as as a guest on other people's podcasts uh, in the last year uh, I have a couple more interviews coming up so i do enjoy this it's not uh, as i don't know rigorous and well thought out a way of uh, sharing my thinking or discussing topics as long-form writing or even tweet storms but it's, yeah, I don't know what it's for, but I hope I figure out in what ways it works. Anyway, hope you enjoy it and I'll see you guys next time.